everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Are You Kidding Me? I'm Naomi Schaefer Riley, and I'm a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And I am Ian Rowe, also a resident fellow at AEI. And today I'm very excited to say that we are joined by Chris Cerf, who is an amazing educator whose resume is incredible. Chris was the deputy chancellor in New York City, the state commissioner in New Jersey, the superintendent of Newark Schools. Chris has been a pioneer in education reform for many years, which is very relevant given the current context of so many districts across the country who this spring were thrust into urgently remote learning and distance learning their kids. And now all of the scenario planning that is occurring for the fall, Chris, and and I will say in full disclosure, I was part of the team that co-founded something called the National Summer School Initiative. Chris has been very instrumental in launching this initiative that just occurred over the last five weeks. And it seems that there are a lot of lessons learned, Chris, that now might be helpful to districts and charter schools planning for the fall. So welcome and tell us a little bit about what the National Summer School Initiative was and why it was created in the first place. Thanks so much. I'd be, I'd be delighted to. It's good to be with you all this afternoon. So the National Summer School Initiative really arose out of the extraordinary planning challenge that districts and charter schools and networks across the country faced this past spring when all of a sudden traditional teaching in a physical space in a brick and mortar environment became literally impossible as district after district closed and as educational organizations sought a way to continue learning into the spring. Obviously, some organizations did rather brilliantly at that. Almost all of them tried mightily, and many of them struggled. As we got into the summer, it was very, very clear that the need was urgent to continue offering high-quality educational opportunities to kids all across the country to avoid learning loss and to sustain the gains they had made and in the hope of recommencing their traditional education in the fall, having continued their trajectory upwards as they achieve a mastery of the critical skills that enable success in life. So a handful of us, Ian, my interlocutor, and I, and several others, said we really wanted to do something that made a difference nationally. We did not want to do it as a vendor. I think all organizations have been inundated by companies that are seeking to find a market in these trying times. And so we went out and raised $4 $4 million dollars philanthropically and built a virtual summer school that really, I have to say, in all immodesty, was a big success. We served about 12,000 children in 18 states in 53 different communities or school organizations. It was a program that really hit three or four core needs. Everyone is talking about remote education, virtual education, but very few folks are asking the question, what constitutes effective or quality virtual education? So we wove together a program that has just a couple of features, if I could go into them. One is we think it's really important to try to recreate the sort of personal connection between teacher and students, a purely asynchronous of student-directed activity certainly has a place. But we wanted to take full advantage of that sort of magical connection between teachers and students, even in a remote environment. And we did that by inventing, if you will, a really interesting interplay between one-to-many and one-to-few education. We hired some of the absolute best, and I mean best and most successful educators in the country in reading and math, denominated them mentor teachers, and partnered them with local instructors, partner teachers. What grades were you doing? These were grades three through eight and were rising four through rising nine. So that was one feature to have the mentor, the mentor teachers teach a class and have and then do a handoff to the partner teachers to do the sort of small group instruction and then back to the mentor teachers to work together. That was one feature. How many mentor teachers were there and how many partner there teachers? There were 16 all together. And I believe the partner teachers were, I think it was close to 550, if I recall the number. So 16 mentor teachers teaching one-to-many, interacting with 500 partner teachers who had, what, maybe 25 kids in their direct care? Probably average 25. But to make that make sense, Ian, I think we should paint a picture of this. And so to give you a visual, if you will, 
Imagine the 25 third graders you know, show up online at nine in the morning. They meet their partner teacher who they've gotten to know, their local local teacher. She has a morning meeting or homeroom, if you will. And then at 9.30, on comes the mentor teacher who has had extraordinary success in his or her career. She teaches a, for example, a novel studies or a close reading or a math story class. And she's actually teaching a class with children who we call showcase kids. There are students who are actually interacting with the mentor teacher. And then at a particular moment, the mentor teacher gives a verbal signal for the partner teacher to work with their small group of children to solve a math problem, for example. And then it returns back to the mentor teacher to sort of aggregate and summarize the lesson. So that's how that sort of interplay went between mentor teacher and partner teacher, which I think was a sort of new approach. And then we layered in student directed activities like Lexia or Edmentum Exact Path or Newzella and enrichment activities, yoga, dance, experimental based science laboratories, and so on. And the program was about four hours, four hours long. And the last feature I'll just say, and then off to questions, is the really critical part of this is professional development. We work really, really closely, not only on a pre-service basis with our teachers, but also on a daily basis to work with our teachers to get ready for the next day's class. What are the most important things that you think the mentor teachers got across to the partner teachers that they didn't have before that prevented remote learning from being a success for so many students this past spring? Well, first of all, I want to be very, very clear that we didn't sort of view this as a hierarchy with the mentor teachers being at one point on the hierarchy and partner teachers being at a a lesser place. But as someone who taught high school history for four years myself, I know that watching great instruction is a critical part and was a critical part of my development. And, you know, we hired a national search firm and we went out and found teachers who had gotten, you know, 30, 40 points of gains in reading and math and really were craftspeople of the art of effective teaching. And so it's literally working with and modeling that is is a very positive development in the life of many many teachers. It also is very true that even the most brilliant educators in a traditional physical setting are not necessarily equally as effective in a remote setting. There are elements of the delivery of the pedagogy that indeed are different in a remote setting. And we really worked with our mentor teachers to be able to use that environment and that modality effectively. So Naomi, imagine that the mentor teacher is actually at least one day ahead in terms of teaching lessons to all of the partner teachers within their given grade or subject. So the mentor teacher has their own what we call showcase kids, so maybe six or seven students. And when they teach that lesson, they videotape it. Mm -hmm. So now two days later, when you do that daily intellectual preparation with the now partner teachers in sixth grade novel studies, the mentor teacher actually plays their video of the lesson that the partner teacher is going to teach the next day. It's sort of a guide sharing exactly the, both the positives and negatives. What are the student misconceptions? What are examples of student work? So it's the kind of intellectual preparation that helps each partner teacher know what to anticipate the next day. And it's one of these lessons that we do think is very survivable into the fall. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, in- Well, first, I'm curious about whether you were able to learn anything about kind of the the kids' experience with this and what their experience had been in the spring, whether you were able to figure out, you know, how far behind they were as a result of what happened in the spring, or also what you learned, if, if anything, that was surprising about how kids respond to different kinds of remote learning. That's such an interesting question. So we, first of all, as a sort of not-for-profit, sort of led by folks and designed by folks who really were sort of committed to the mission of effective instruction and had no other motive than to try to make a difference. We were very, very focused on exactly those questions. So we hired a third-party evaluator to evaluate it, and we did repeated sort of surveys and et cetera of all the stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, partner teachers, mentor teachers, to try to sort of take a pulse of how this was being received and how it was working. And I will say the narrative, if you read the national media, has been, oh, my gosh, remote teaching is a disaster. Everybody hates it. We got to get back to physical, traditional teaching environments. And by the way, all of us certainly endorse 
yes, let's get back to traditional teaching quickly and well. I don't want to be Pollyannish about that. But our findings were very, very remarkably positive that the stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, all gave this very, very high ratings. We'd be happy to share the sort of survey material, the net promoter score, which is one metric, which was really surprisingly good. It was a very powerful and successful experience and one that we are carrying over to the fall. We're working with districts and schools and individual organizations to try to take the lessons learned from the summer and make them available to these organizations um, in the fall as well. So is it scalable, Chris, that can you can you still have 16 mentor teachers in grades three through eight to now be working with thousands of partner teachers across the country? How would that how does that work even with curriculum? How do you make that actually happen for kids? It is scalable. I think when you have a one to many environment for and the mentor teachers are one to many. So the mentor teacher is teaching all of the third grades in 18 states in 15 different communities. And she or he is delivering the lesson and then handing it over to the partner teacher who's working, say, with 20 students or 25 students and so on. So it is very scalable at that level. Certainly at some point, it reaches a level where it's necessary to expand the number of mentor teachers. And we are, in fact, prepared to do that or in the process of engaging additional teachers. By the way, I'll use this opportunity to say that we'd love to hear from folks who may want to serve in that role. But I do think it is by definition, scalable. I mean, if you look at a student-directed learning application, I mean, they are basically a piece of software that uses an algorithm to identify where a child is, what skill needs to be developed, and then automatically feeds a lesson and then takes a test to see whether that skill was mastered. So that is 100% scalable. I just think it is, as a standalone item, sort of lacks the sort of look and feel of uh, comprehensive and effective personal education. So there are many districts across the country who are basically saying that there must be an all remote option for some percentage of their kids, either because the parents don't feel comfortable sending their kids back to school or the kids may have an underlying condition, whatever the reasons are, is the idea that there could be this high quality remote learning program that's just out there in the world that every any district could essentially opt into if it wanted to drive their kids to this resource? Uh, that is exactly the idea. My heart goes out to the education leaders out there who coming into the summer were like, thinking through all the various possibilities as the critical determinative facts were not yet at all clear. And so people talked about bringing everybody back or a staggered A day, B day, or some kind of hybrid variant or honoring the perspective of parents who, for whatever reason, felt uncomfortable or coming back to a physical school or individual teachers or, or students who also felt uncomfortable or who happened to be in a household where somebody was ill. So as people were sort of playing with all of these possibilities, the facts on the ground changed and they've changed in a pretty dramatic way meaning that now districts that did not, if you will, pick a lane because they were trying to preserve all possibilities while the facts evolved, found themselves not having developed any lane particularly comprehensively and are now really struggling to respond. And so what we have is an opportunity, which will be extremely inexpensive, by the way, and perhaps even more for many, many districts or networks, where if you don't have a virtual solution that you feel good about, we have one that we would love to invite you to participate in that we think is not only one of a kind, but has got some of the best instruction and professional development you can get out there. What's the curriculum that you used or are offering with this? Sure. In math, we use something called math stories. These are all conceptually guided instruction okay. in reading, novel studies, and close reading. We then paired that with student-directed activities, which is basically you don't have it. That is an entirely remote system. Lexia would be one example. Dreambox would be an example. Edmentum's exact path. But these uh, would be but, curriculum that would be familiar to most districts anyway. So They absolutely would. And they pair very well with things like Eureka and Wit and Wisdom and Core Knowledge. They're really based on the idea that engaging the student, not in the mechanics of the process of solving a math problem, but in deep conceptual understanding, 
right. and seeing the multiple ways that you know other students have solved the same math problem is really the path to really deeply understanding mathematics. Uh, and, and there's an equivalent in close reading. I just had one last yeah. question. So you said that it was for grades three through eight, and I know a lot of people are are struggling with the younger kid question. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are it's it's much mm -hmm. harder for those younger children under grade three to be able to sit and look at a screen for that long. And why did you pick these years in particular? And do you think this is where kind of we could see the greatest improvement and that there is potential for real engagement and remote learning for this for these grade levels you talked about? Yeah, well, we we did it more for sort of practical reasons and educational or ideological reasons, meaning that this is where in a very brief period of time, we felt we could make the greatest difference quickly. We certainly acknowledge the need for a superb pre-K through two program as well, as well as of course for a high school program. There's, there's a lot more optionality in the high school area through yeah. courseware. And, and we actually still have the ambition to add on a pre-K through two program. You know, I will tell you it's sort of going way, way out on a limb. If I were if I were in charge, if we actually did have a national policy, which most assuredly we do not, what I would have done is strongly encourage a return to brick and mortar education for pre-K through two, where the epidemiological evidence is much stronger, if certainly not absolute, that the risks are dramatically lower. Right. And used K-6 or pre-K through 6 or pre-K through 8 buildings to enable social distancing of those younger kids and to, then to have had a 3 through 8 program and a high school program, at least from Labor Day or the start of school through, let's say, the first semester or Thanksgiving, while we continue to see how the facts develop. I should say I speak for no one other than myself on that, but that at least would have been clarity. And that would have given a little bit more. Clarity. Time. Chris, are you clarity. kidding me? Who wants clarity? <laughs> oh, I so enjoy when they offer us three scenarios with 50 bullet points under each scenario of what could possibly happen. It's like a choose your own adventure for the fall. Exactly. I, I will tell you one anecdote on that. I don't know how our time is, but I won't give up her name or district, but a large East Coast district serving at least 100,000 students. When the plan emerged, this person happens to be running the sort of human relations people function in the district. All of the regulations added up to sometime in the last week of July being said, yeah, this is how we're going to do this. Oh, by the way, we need to hire 1,300 teachers to manage our social distancing. Can you get that done in the next two weeks? <laughs> Which I think caused her head to explode. But that is exactly the problem. This is a serious problem. In the absence of this kind of high quality remote option, mm -hmm. how are districts supposed to solve this problem where because of social distancing rules, you've got to hire 1,300 teachers? I mean, it's, right. it's uh, funny, but it's, this it, is a it, very it, it is, issue. Absolutely. And that's why we're doing what we're doing, because I do think that the trending, despite all of the noise and all the uncertainty, I think the clear trending now is that Many, 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 many districts have decided to honor the preference of parents, basically to make it parent option, at least in the beginning of the year. Many districts are now going, well, in this environment of certainty, our pre-existing plans for a hybrid or A day, B day just are not going to work, at least in the short term. So let's decide to open with a purely remote solution, very much with the ambition of migrating to a hybrid or a physical modality as quickly as we can, but let's do the remote one well at the opening of school. That seems to be, if there is a national trend to discern, that seems to be the national trend right now. All right. Well, here's hoping. Uh, what are we like, four weeks out now? Less for some districts, but... There are districts across the country that have already started. Yeah. That have opened and closed. Yes. It's coming for us next, Ian. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Is there a website? Or can you tell sure. us? Sure. Schoolsreimagined.org. Schools we will put, put cool. that up with the podcast. You can find the podcast on the AEI podcast channel or wherever you get your podcasts. I am Naomi schaefer Riley, And I'm Ian Rowe. Chris, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Some thank sanity you. and clarity in, in an otherwise sea of confusion. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Me.